Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, from the image that you see on your screen, you will get a pretty good idea of uh, the topic that Patrick is going to pick up as we talk about World Environmental Health Day 2014. It's the issue uh, that we've been talking about throughout the day of are we exporting not 21st century knowledge but 19th century thinking. At the time the Chicago Sanitary Canal was built, it was the biggest, most important piece of environmental engineering of its day and it was designed to make one of the major cities in the US livable. Um, to remove waste that the option there of course was it's not my problem anymore it's um, St. Louis's and so at this point Patrick I am going to uh, close my screen sharing and hand off to you. Thank you Dendra. Okay so go ahead and start your slides and take it away. And I'm just going to again confirm that you've got a slide on the screen. Yes, I do. Go ahead. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, you'll notice I've modified slightly the title of this third talk. Um, and I'm going to take us way back to the 16 and 1700s, to the age of alchemy. And I think we actually are, in many ways, in the early part of the 21st century, back where we were in the mid to late 1700s, when the world as we knew it then, the Western world certainly, was undergoing a profound set of changes because of new insight and knowledge that had come about through the beginnings of early science, global exploration, and an awareness of the many of the issues that were just beginning to crop up uh, that Dendra covered so well in the first session. And you'll notice that I've modified the terms again. This is governed and engineered ecology. Nature's revenue streams, obviously a play on words, or a denial dilemma. And the denial dilemma is simply that the world is perfectly fine. Yes, we have some small problems, but by and large, the next couple of centuries will just carry on like the last couple of centuries. And I think increasingly most people, no matter where they live, are beginning to realize that that in fact is not the case. If we are going to adopt a design with nature or a what we call an eco or biomimicry model, then we need to address two elements. The first of course is infrastructure and when I say infrastructure, I'm thinking of both man-made infrastructure, the pipes and wires that come in and roads that are in our cities and our countrysides, as well as the streams and the wetlands. So it really is this completely integrated um, and interconnection between natural capital and human capital. And of course, governance or the, the, the model by which we agree to make decisions um, both in terms of legislation and regulation um, that affect our social structures, our financial structures, um, all aspects of human society. Um, in the past, as we've shown in previous sessions, we're largely based on a model that was exploitive. In other words, the planet was there for our plundering and the consequences really aren't all that relevant. And that's what I mean by the denial dilemma. And so in this next and last session um, of mine, I'm going to walk you through what I think are some of the key elements that will literally um, enable us to get through this challenge of and transition between the 20th and pre-century thinking and the new century of thinking in um, the 21st century. So back to our valuing nature's infrastructure slide moving from conventional engineering through the greening up of our landscapes to literally an engineered ecology approach. Through this construct I mentioned in the previous session on integrated resource management where at every step in the process we are looking at recovering um, resources to reuse them and every time we do something, no matter what it is, 
some aspect of that design and development decision must result in the regeneration of natural capital or functional landscape ecology. And of course, the last two slides are summed up in this slide. When we move from the left to the right, from closed to open, or from a, an open to a closed loop system, we move from taxpayer costs to taxpayer revenues. And I'll come back to this because it's one of the cornerstones of some of the challenges that I think we're facing um, in the decision making uh, arenas today. If we think about sustainable or self sustaining, uh, which is a term I prefer, I don't really, as an ecologist, understand this concept of sustainability. Um, perhaps others have, but I can't find an ecological analog of sustainability. Self sustaining, yes, but not sustainability. Um, however, it is a word that is deeply entrenched in the lexicon, in the dictionaries, and the general discussion uh, that we have. So for the moment, I'll continue to use it. Essentially, we're moving from the building scale up through the campus or neighborhood scale to the community scale and then into large watershed scales. So it is about integrating, in terms of ecology on the outside ring, water, wastes, materials, energy, and then this complex interrelated group of um, issues that make up the communities that we live in. I've borrowed a set of slides from a colleague of mine, Professor Nick Ashbolt, um, out of Australia via the EPA and now at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, a microbial ecologist focusing on public health related issues. And in this slide, he's simply um, graphically illustrating the types of water that can come into in a fit for purpose um, design where you have a small amount of drinking water, household water and rainwater coming in. We have a range of different uses from the kitchen to washing our clothes, toilets to outdoor irrigation and then the water going out moves through a set of different treatment modes which may also include energy and or um, um, water and nutrient recovery. If we expand that model from the household up to a community or a neighborhood, we begin to understand that we need a more complex um, and integrated set of pipes rather than the very simple and traditional model that we have where you have all the water coming in in a city, main, city mains water and stormwater often going out uh, in its own pipe and then sewage going out in a third pipe and in many, many cities, uh, combined sewer overflow issues result because the stormwater was often dumped into the sewer mains and or if the sewer mains weren't large enough to carry a lot of the runoff from the um, uh, I and I problems, that is non-sewage water getting into the pipes, they backed up and flowed out into our storm drains and those then flowed out uh, into our local waterways and uh, nearshore marine environments. In Australia, given many of the challenges that Australia is facing, two approaches are being used um, to address water supply. One is the type shown here, which is essentially a recovery model. And then many of the larger cities have now engaged in a desalination approach where you use large amounts of energy to desalinate water and then put that water into, water into the uh, reservoirs or the city mains and that then um, is a competing economic model for a regenerative or recovery uh, of water that's already come from our reservoirs. If we think about um, much of what I talked about in the second session that is the greening up of the buildings in our cities and of course there are many green building rating systems around the world um, Australia has their systems, China's developing systems, Japan, Canada, Great Britain, France, Germany um, are developing theirs. Probably the most famous of all is the US Green Building Council program. What we see when we look at recovering resources and designing systems that need far fewer resources in order to create a livable and comfortable environment we see large reductions in energy use, in CO2 emissions, in water use, and especially in the production of solid wastes 
historically, most of which ended up in our landfills. I would argue that as important as this is, it's largely a function of large-scale Western-style urban um, environments. It's not going to be that kind of municipal infrastructure that much of the developing world is going to implement. However, having said that, many of the lessons that we need to learn and much of the research that we need to conduct very quickly, I think, is going to come from some of the developing um, world cities. Uh, this is uh, an image that I've shown earlier. It's the image of the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, here in Canada on the west coast. Um, the Southeast Falls Creek Olympic Village was one of the case studies I highlighted uh, in the second session. But I draw your attention to the mountainous um, region in the background called the North Shore. It's made up of three municipalities and it has um, a very old and aging infrastructure in terms of its sewerage system. Uh, all of the water supply for the city of Vancouver, which is a city now of about two million people, comes from two or three reservoirs um, located in the um, mountains uh, up in behind the North Shore. So the North Shore community has a population of about 200,000. It's growing quite rapidly. As you can see in this image, it's a mix of residential, commercial, and industry. And most importantly, it is nestled at the base of this mountain chain, which rises up behind the city. Um, the mountains there range from about four to five and a half thousand feet in elevation. Uh, they have a fairly substantial snow pack uh, from roughly November through April. Um, the city of Vancouver gets its water from rainwater in the early fall and late spring and then it recharges its reservoirs in the summer uh, as the snow melts and the rainfall um, in the city declines quite substantially. So the challenge for the Metro Vancouver region, uh, which is the overarching uh, governance body, which looks after things like uh, transportation, public transportation, parks, um, drinking water supply and sewage, was to replace an old single uh, centralized plant with a new plant, um, design unknown, and the three municipalities that make up the North Shore community, uh, together with Metro Vancouver, asked a group that uh, I'm part of to consider two design options. A simple, large-scale centralized plant that would replace the existing plant, or a decentralized um, model with potentially many small plants. Um, the, both models would look at the potential for resource recovery and revenue generation. And we spent uh, the better part of a year, 18 months, conducting a study, which was then used as the basis for a two-year um, program within the community to explore the different options and essentially the community had to come to a consensus and decide which option they wanted to pursue uh, given that the cost of this facility was going to be around uh, four to six hundred million just for the plant. Um, they have a about a one in a 1.2 billion um, infrastructure program over the next hundred years and all of that at the moment is based on simple taxpayer uh, revenue streams. So the purpose of the North Shore was to look at the potential to recover resources from wastewater, to look at solid waste uh, resource recovery. Um, currently in Canada and in much of the rest of North America, we have liquid waste management planning processes and solid waste management planning processes. And then we have drinking water supply management programs as well. The province of BC, three or four years ago, made a political decision to um, explore reducing its greenhouse gas reductions by as much as 80% by 2050. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we're still the only jurisdiction in North America that has a carbon tax. Um, and that uh, 
the other element here was uh, conservation of water. Like the rest of North America, we're seeing precipitation patterns. As our snowpacks become less, our ability to recharge reservoirs following an initial um, um, filling up with rainwater is decreasing, and the entire water management program was based on our ability to recharge the reservoirs twice a year. So to summarize the study we were asked to look at, we looked at seven options. And this was based on essentially the least desirable of disposing of wastes of any kind or energy, um, generating and recovering resources, recycling resources, reducing and ultimately avoiding the need for any kind of resource use uh, in, in the first place. So we looked at a series of distributed wastewater treatment plants uh, all the way down to a large single centralized plant. So we laid out the study by identifying sources of waste, i.e. resources that could be potentially recovered and then reused, markets for those reclaimed water. This is a, an image of very large uh, boxcars carrying coal for export to, the middle, um, to Southeast Asia, and the coal and other large resource piles and the cars themselves are routinely watered down um, very often using drinking water. Most of the high-rise apartments uh, in this part of the city are hydronically heated. That is, they have hot water boilers in their basements, and those boilers have a 25 to 30-year lifespan, and most of these buildings were built 25 to 30 years ago, so the boilers are um, in imminent need of, of replacement. Space for putting in facilities, particularly if that space is already owned by government, rather than chewing up private sector space that could be used for some kind of um, residential or commercial or retail development, and then looking at aging infrastructure that needs to be replaced anyway. This is an example in the lower left-hand corner of a model, or sorry, of a sewer lift station that needs to be replaced at a cost of around 10 to 15 million dollars, if memory serves me correctly, and that is money that could be used to rethink paying for a different type of infrastructure. The resource recovery highway essentially consists of all of those former waste streams shown here on the left, which when we use a set of chemical and industrial processes lead to the generation of a series of resources and then we have a set of social choices about how and where to use those resources. So for example, if we're producing biodiesel, are we going to use that uh, in cars? Um, or are we going to use that to fund public transit? There are many different reasons why we might want to um, think about how we're going to use those resources uh, in the marketplace. This is just an example of the kind of engineering diagram that we typically see for an integrated resource center where we have a series of waste streams coming in. As I pointed out in the previous slide, a set of um, processes that enable us to convert those wastes into uh, resources and then that leads to either electricity or heat. Um, it could be uh, a gas that can be used to drive generators or boilers for hot water and heating of buildings. So the study began first with identifying in this community a fairly significant um, industrial site where very substantial quantities of energy were used almost always once and then discharged in some form as a waste product. We looked at initially a whole series of small decentralized plants which would be tied to a central piece of infrastructure which we would use as a utilidor to move energy and resources throughout and around the community. So this would be heat uh, or water. And we then looked at, uh, at the request of the regional government, one large centralized wastewater treatment plant. What we ended up with, and I'm going to show you some uh, examples of the modeling that we engaged in. So this was literally about developing very sophisticated models that would enable the community to look at costs and revenue streams, um, and those models would be engineering, they would be ecological, they would be financial, they would be governance, 
and they would also um, have a social component that is the community has to accept that we're going to begin building infrastructure differently um, if the community is unwilling to engage in that discussion oftentimes what we see is we end up doing what we've always done and if you always do what you've always done you always get what you always got and in that sense nothing really changes so this is just an example of the f one of the financial models that we looked at um, the model had about 9,000 variables and was used to generate about 1800 cash flows some of which I'm going to show you briefly so this is an example of one of the models so this is scenario modeling so you build the model and then you literally explore what would happen if you designed a system in a certain way uh, you would look at what potential revenue streams are available you would look at the um, cost initially of building the plant versus the revenue streams and you would run sensitivity models to determine whether or not a small change or a, a change in one of the variables or public acceptance or interest rates might have um, or would have an influence and a degree of that influence on the long-term financial projections when we ran the models so we ran seven scenarios uh, number seven is a central wastewater treatment plant alone um, and I'm only showing the uh, six um, other models here you'll notice very significant differences in um, the amount of reclaimed water available um, which was fairly standard throughout um, uh, each of the models because that's a water in water out uh, effect uh, residuals in from anaerobic digestion are pretty much the same because the sludge digestion is going to remain constant over the life cycle of these plants which was about till 2060 but look at the difference in greenhouse gas uh, emissions um, and the ability to take the revenue or the uh, resources from the greenhouse gas reductions and put them into the marketplace if we look at that slightly differently <coughs> uh, or present that differently the after finance dividend of the initial studies that we ran literally highlighted how the different scenarios lead to very very different financial projections uh, for this particular uh, wastewater treatment plant facility um, the difference between scenario number four and scenario number seven are profound a single plant with no resource recovery um, the best modern plant but built in the old-fashioned um, uh, urban infrastructure design model came out at about a 1.1 billion cost to the taxpayer schedule 4 indicated that the system might actually be self-financing in other words it might actually over the lifespan of the project uh, be profitable this is another way of presenting those same kinds of, um, of outputs from these models um, the upper model is the capital cost uh, on the uh, left hand axis and the different case scenarios uh, on the horizontal and on the far right hand side you end up with the net present value and of course scenario number five actually has a positive value uh, when you compare the capital cost versus the revenues if you look at the greenhouse gas reductions that is tons per year case 5 actually um, is reducing greenhouse gas emissions by about 250,000 tons annually the initial um, case study the business as usual reduces almost no greenhouse gases so very substantial um, emissions profiles simply based on understanding that we can model these systems very differently however as sophisticated as these models are what we've learned is that the politicians and the taxpayers essentially want everything reduced to one single number that is the cost per door or the increase in their annual tax so this is an example of one of those um, models that we ran that simply showed um, the initial costs 
to build the facilities and then the decrease in the tax base support as the revenue streams come online and ultimately a number of the politicians found this type of model the model that they need to understand what's going on not because they aren't sophisticated people but because they don't have tons of time to explain what's going on to the general population and most of these discussions typically take place uh, during an election cycle something else that um, we discovered uh, that others are obviously aware of um, but was particularly prevalent in the North Shore of Vancouver is the demographic age structure of the communities the average age of one of the communities was over 60 it's the wealthiest community in Canada and the population demographic and the value of the properties in that community are such that it's very difficult for young people to move into that community and take over the homes or the businesses of those people wanting to retire and I've borrowed this um, uh, diagram here from the US Census Bureau it's um, now about six years out of date but I think it still by and large holds true and this is showing that the um, male and female demographic is changing and that as we move further into the 21st century we are finding in the West this is not true in much of the developing world but in the West the baby boomer generation is making up a larger and larger percentage of the population but they're in retirement mode and so the number of actual taxpayers and the amount of taxable income generated by the younger generation that is the under 35 is in inverse proportion to each other that is to say the 18 to 35 age range is not making the same kind of money that the boomers made in the same time period when they were 18 to 35 nor what the boomers are making today and there's been a 50 percent reduction in that statistic in the last 10 or 15 years in Canada so the capacity of the taxpayer to pay for this aging infrastructure which Dendra spoke about earlier as requiring perhaps in the US as much as 1.2 trillion dollars figures I've seen go as high as 4.3 trillion globally is simply no longer there what that means is we need to fundamentally rethink how we're going to pay for the landscapes in the cities that we live in this is a, an aerial um, uh, or a satellite view of the United States the white arrow is pointing to the Cape Cod area and Cape Cod is operating currently um, under a consent decree from the US EPA to um, dramatically enhance its capacity on the Cape to treat uh, wastewater estimates for that um, treatment process um, are as high as uh, one to one and a half billion dollars for a fairly standard uh, 20th and 8th, 19th century wastewater um, uh, planning process where you put pipes in the ground you connect everybody up to a centralized plant you treat it to secondary or better and then you discharge to the ocean so the old open linear model there are only about 200,000 people living in Cape Cod this is clearly not a financially viable model at the same time in order to address the ecological um, issues around nutrient enrichment in the near shore uh, and coastal zone management areas on the Cape something has to be done to strip the nutrients both nitrogen and phosphorus from the wastewater being generated by the communities that live there one of the discussions that is uh, being held is to think of the entire Cape as a special demonstration management zone in other words rule intent met by alternative means so the governance and the regulatory requirements still apply to the Cape that's the law of the land the question is are we going to force the Cape to build what all the rest of us built or can the regulators the communities 
the private and public sector and NGO groups get together and literally rethink what each community is going to do and turn the entire Cape into essentially a large demonstration zone and field test a wide range of different um, technologies, each of which is amenable and desired by the local community. That information then becomes readily available for other communities. Here on the west coast in Victoria is a community called the city of Colwood. It has about 15,000 people and it has decided to aggressively explore turning its entire municipality into a special demonstration management zone. So it would literally look at designing and building decentralized wastewater because it has no wastewater treatment at the moment. About 20% of the 16,000 people, so about four or 5,000 people are currently connected to large um, regional um, sewer mains. Everybody else is on septic fields. So the community has decided that it's going to take a true watershed scale planning process and within that it's going to look at how it integrates uh, all forms of water, energy and natural capital. Um, that would then enable it to be used as a demonstration management zone to scale up for the rest of the regional, um, uh, the rest of the region which is about 330,000 odd people. One of the challenges that we face if we're thinking about this in minute detail is the actual process of development. So for example, um, one of the challenges that we face can be seen in the lower right hand corner. This is a subdivision being built somewhere in North America and that means you uh, disturb the landscape, you strip off the vegetation and in the process you begin putting in homes, gardens or lawns, streets, curbs and gutters perhaps, um, sidewalks in some communities and standard infrastructure. What we've observed over the last 10 or 15 years is one of the most threatening and ecological risky time periods uh, to a landscape, to a watershed is during construction. And this is simply a matter of excess of sediment loading and highly inappropriate or the absence of erosion and sediment control plans. So if we look at some local examples here in the Victoria region, <clears throat> these are images of fairly standard construction and clearly the um, regulators and the managers and the developers are not paying attention to all of the compounds coming off the landscape which are going into our um, receiving waters. The challenge both in Canada and the States is that we no longer have the regulatory oversight that's needed and in many cases we're moving back to the 70s and 80s essentially the Wild West. Since we can't obtain the kinds of resources we need to put third-party regulatory compliance and uh, monitoring in place. Um, another company and I have made the argument that we should do this using modern um, iPhone technology and what we've developed is a program where we take the US and Canada green building um, program requirements for erosion and sediment control and we have simply put it into an iPhone. So anyone uh, selected on a development project as the um, erosion sediment control monitor um, will have an iPhone or another similar device and they will use that to scroll through a series of fields to document what's going on uh, on that site at any point during development. And this image just gives you a, a, an example of many of the different fields that we can look at, uh, record maintenance, um, structural practices, um, soil and stockpile debris, um, compounds such as paints and oil thinners that uh, have the potential to be discharged uh, inadvertently into receiving environments and the form is written in the same manner as the US EPA pollution prevention uh, program um, models 
and that the uh, U.S. GBC and Canada Green Building Council require as part of their LEED Green Building rating systems. In order to keep everybody honest, because of course anybody could just say yes or no, and there would be no independent third-party verification of that um, monitoring assessment, uh, photographs have to be taken, and we've developed another program that enables us to take repeat photographs, and they're precisely superimposable. So I'm showing here an image of a set of photographs taken over a 10-year period, and you can see the power pylon in the background, and each of these images is precisely superimposable. The image on the lower right-hand corner has a series of measuring devices embedded within the photograph, and that enables us to take direct quantitative measurements off the photograph uh, at any point during the um, photo point monitoring. Just to give you an example of what that looks like, uh, this is a stream realignment and restoration program we're doing uh, in the Rocky Mountains. And here a colleague is taking a photograph to document changes uh, over time. And here's an example of those two images taken um, in the same year, three or four months apart. And you can see the change in vegetation. And both of those images are precisely superimposable. And again, we're back to this whole concept of superimposability. And what that leads to is an individual in the field using a digital device. They hit send. That image is sent to the local municipality who acknowledges that the monitoring program or the monitoring report has been received. And if anything is needed to be printed out as a report, either the on-site monitor or the regulator literally calls it up in the computer and hits the print key and the entire report is printed out. The intent here is to literally reduce the cost of monitoring to one or two cents on the dollar compared to what it was like uh, five or ten years ago when we had independent third-party party monitoring going on all paid for by the taxpayer. This is paid for by the development and is literally a requirement for a building permit and if it isn't done properly then that's tied to an occupancy permit and of course from the developers perspective you can't sell anything or transfer property until you have an occupancy permit so it's a, a set of feedback loops that essentially keep everybody honest and doesn't need a phalanx of people to do it one of the other concepts that we have uh, stumbled on is this concept of habitat banking so in both of our countries, if you want to um, engage in some process that leads to the harm or destruction of uh, functional eco ecosystem landscapes, there is a requirement either under the Federal Fisheries Act in Canada, or the Clean Water Act, and many other regulations federally and at the state and local level to either avoid that harm or to compensate. In a nutshell, what we have discovered is that if we take the, if we understand the complete process by which compensation occurs, that is the regulated and authorized despoilation of habitat and the compensation for that harm somewhere else, there is in fact a model which lays out what the total cost of that is going to be, both in terms of financing and in time which of course is a very valuable commodity. If we look at an example of an existing habitat uh, here on the coast of British Columbia, this is a historic booming ground for the logging industry. The marine benthic landscape was almost completely destroyed. And if you compare that to an area immediately beside the area that was destroyed, which is fully functional, you can clearly see the differences between the productivity and the ecological health of these two landscapes. My colleagues um, in the company that we're working with on this undertook a series of restorative treatments and rebuilt those landscapes. It's very expensive. What we've been able to show is that if you actually engage in a process whereby you go out and take a landscape that, is, that you're not obligated to repair and you restore it and that restoration is deemed to be 
um, to a standard that meets the regulatory requirement, you can then take that landscape and put it in an ecological conservation bank. We're not the only ones doing this, of course. Many, many other people are doing this. We've done this now over the last decade, and what we've shown is it's actually profitable. In other words, it's an, an opportunity for global capital to invest in restoration ecology because they can then sell that to someone down the road uh, as compensatory habitat. And so what are the design criteria? Here's an example that I used in the second session in terms of agriculture. We went from the image on the far right um, in the lower right hand corner to the image in the center. We simply converted a drainage ditch into a fully functional um, ecological wetland. Uh, we used the US Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management proper function and condition uh, criteria to do this. These have all been judicially reviewed and are the law of the land on um, US national forest and here in British Columbia for much of our uh, crown land. And of course at the end of the day what you end up with is a landscape in the lower um, image that is now potentially saleable. We've taken this approach and we're now applying it to entire watersheds. This is a watershed north of Victoria. We have three watersheds, the Leech River watershed to the far west that is on the left hand side. It's been almost completely logged out uh, for the second or third time over the last 120 years. The Souk Lake watershed, the one in the center, supplies almost all of the drinking water for the city of Victoria and its uh, regional um, area. And then we have the watershed to the northeast of Souk Lake and that's the Shawnigan Lake watershed. The difference between Souk Lake and Shawnigan Lake is simply Shawnigan Lake has a great many people living in it and Souk Lake is completely walled off and has no public access. So what we're presently in the process of developing are a set of comparative watershed studies to look at whether it's actually financially feasible to regenerate the functional health of the Shawnigan Lake watershed and whether that can be done um, using a different set of financial models. So here's an example of uh, one of the subcatchments, the McGee catchment. Um, I'll just back up and that's the catchment shown here in red and the assessment shows those elements of the stream or the wetlands or the ponds that are healthy in green, those that are in trouble or non-functional or sorry functional at risk in yellow and a few that are actually trashed, those are in red. What we're interested in here is in recognizing that this landscape, this sub-watershed is largely owned by three individuals. There's a large farm, this is this square in the middle, and this area just immediately upstream of the farm, and then virtually all of the rest of the watershed, except for a small portion around the lake, is owned by two timber companies. What we're interested in doing is asking whether we can actually lease the habitat from the owners. So I'm showing an example of an abandoned farm field. I'm interested in knowing whether I can put a dam at the south end, at the downstream end of this field, shown here in the lower right, and simply turn it back to what it was 150 years ago, which was a very large wetland. That would allow me to create an enormous amount of um, aquatic habitat for salmon and for um, migratory waterfowl, but it would also enable me to store very significant volumes of water which could then be slowly released during the summer period when this entire system typically goes dry and that water would then supplement the lake water from which almost everybody in the community derives their drinking water. So in summary, just to close this up in the last few minutes, um, what we're suggesting is that there is a fundamentally different way of thinking about how to design the infrastructure that we're completely dependent upon if we integrate the man-made and the natural capital environments. The slide that I have here um, in front of us now
highlight something that we and others have stumbled upon, and that is in the upper right-hand corner, if we look at the um, uh, IPCC models, these are the um, UN millennial models looking at carbon cycling on the planet. Most of these are stratospheric models based on um, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon and methane and other gases, um, which are clearly having an effect on the warming of the planet. What isn't included in these models is what we see in the image in the lower right-hand corner. And that is the influence of the highly nutrient-enriched riparian wetlands um, of the planet. And it turns out that they are able to store extremely high quantities of carbon and they cycle it very rapidly because most of what's going on is microbial. If that is true, and if we're able to regenerate over much of the planet, um, many of the wetlands and these, the ability to revegetate the landscapes we live in, it is entirely feasible that this is actually a profitable venture and will augment other strategies that are being used to reduce um, carbon and uh, methane gas emissions uh, into the planet. A planet's atmosphere. In other words, it's completely rethinking, as I've shown in earlier slides, this whole concept of integrated resource management, where there is no difference between the buried infrastructure in our cities and the infrastructure in our watersheds that provides the water that keeps us healthy um, in our cities. I would suggest that what we need is a 21st century moonshot. The United States, egged on by the Russians in the late 1950s and early 1960s, um, through President Kennedy's declaration in 1961 or 62, I think it was 1962, argued that the United States could put a man on the moon and get him back, very important if you were an astronaut of that age, uh, within a decade. That challenge has given rise to much of the technology that we enjoy today. I would suggest that we need a similar global challenge, which is actually a regenerative economy challenge, and that this requires a new age of persuasion. The image on the left is a single cell uh, phytoplankton. This is a very small um, plant, uh, 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 an, an algal cell, that makes up much of the biomass in our global oceans. That cell is busy producing oxygen and fixing carbon, and yet it's not included in any of the models that we're currently looking at um, in terms of understanding this link between our terrestrial and oceanic um, um, carbon sinks. That's not to say that we're not aware of what's going on uh, in the oceans, but in terms of our planning, we still view the ocean as the ultimate receiving environment for much of what we've done on the terrestrial portion of the planet. If we think about the history of this planet, at the core of all of our biological and ecological knowledge is the simple statement that there is life without oxygen but there is no life without water. There's an old Chinese proverb that the history or the future of the world is written not in ink but in water and I would suggest that if we're going to seek new innovative solutions in the 21st century we need to fundamentally base them on our understanding of how to maintain the health of our aquatic environments and that in the process of doing that we will develop all kinds of insights into new ways of designing those elements of the landscapes that we live in and that we're completely dependent upon in terms of the wildlife that live there. I will end with an old cartoon, Pogo, who observed way back in the 70s, we have met the enemy and he is us. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Um, that 
last image, the one from before this, I think really, really made the point. And uh, I, yes, <laughs> the future of the world is written not in ink but in water. And so with this, I'm going to stop the broadcast for this session and uh, we will move on here. We'll have a 10 minute break. And we'll move on to the last session of the day looking at options that build on a lot of the uh, information that Patrick just included. Uh, we will see you all again in about 10 minutes. <laughs>